Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for coming to the event. Hello. Uh, our friend Marisa is sending around a sign-in sheet. We'd love for you to sign in so we know who's here and so we can stay in touch with you. Uh, my name is Jonathan Bieber. I'm a professor, assistant professor in the Department of Philosophy and director and co-founder of the Center for Ethics. And I'm really pleased. Oh, yes, sorry. I'm going to be walking around. I'm really pleased to be here. We launched the center this past fall with an event that I'll say a little bit more about. Um, and our mission for the center is to help cultivate a culture of ethics here at UCF, starting from our colleagues, faculty and graduate students and students at the university. Um, the work we do at the center is important and my co-director, Dr. Steve Kubler, comes from chemistry and optics and photonics. We're trying to bridge intercollegiality in the college too. So I'm really thankful to Steve for his support. He's away at a leadership conference today, so can't be with us and our Center for Ethics student ambassadors for their ongoing work on behalf of the center. We've got a good group of students, some of whom are here, who are working every couple of weeks with us and presenting work. Um, we just uh, brought a student with us to the Association of Practical and Professional Ethics who presented some of his work. So that's been really exciting too. I'm really pleased to welcome Jonathan Marks to campus. I've known uh, Professor Marks since, uh, for several years now, since my time at Penn State, through the Association of Practical and Professional Ethics and through his leadership and expertise. I, I'll say a little bit more about where this talk came from in a minute, but the more when I got here in 2015 to the university and heard UCF described as America's partnership university, I really wanted to understand what that entailed. And it can be somewhat of an uncomfortable conversation. Partnerships drive most of our institutions of higher education in the 21st century and have for a long time, and they'll continue to do so. But without conversations about it, we run certain risks. And so there's risks and benefits to all of the work we do as, as faculty members, but partnerships especially. And at our fall launch event, uh, Dr. Lisa Lee, who is President Obama's uh, Executive Director of the Presidential Commission for Bioethics, now at uh, Virginia Tech, said something that caught my attention and I want to share that with you now. ourselves clean of, of, of conflicts. The idea is how do we surface those, talk about those, and manage those. Um, and most universities, including yours and, and mine, have a, have a robust system where we have to disclose what our potential conflicts are, and then we have to have a plan to manage that if we're involved in research. And that, you know, for the most part, works very well. I'm talking more about kind of, as a society, how we decide to fund kind of work we're doing. And as, as governmental uh, funding of research declines, industry is uh, filling in in many ways um, behind that and offering uh, re research dollars to, to faculty. Um, and that introduces a different dynamic in terms of, of conflict and conflict of interest and, and conflict of you know, commitment as well. Um, and I think we, you know, to expect a, a brand new assistant professor who is in a research heavy uh, field to go forward and do the good work we need them to do with funding that has strings attached um, is a real challenge. And it's not that it's impossible to manage that, but back to my earlier comment, if we're not preparing people to look at length about institutional ethics, we had a really good conversation between the three of us in the fall, but this particular clip I just shared with you really stuck with me. Um, here, Dr. Lee's calling out the complexities of institutional, calling out the complexities of public-private partnerships as an issue of institutional ethics. And I, from my perspective as an ethicist, this is one reason we need a stronger and ongoing sense of ethics and conversation about ethics at the institution. Um, it's really important to me, and I think it's important to the institution too. So I'm really very glad that Dr. Professor Marks could accept our invitation to speak with us today. Professor Marks is uh, also, besides his role at Penn State, also a barrister and an academic member of the Matrix Chambers in London. Um, while he was in full-time practice, he spent time uh, as counsel of Human Rights Watch, and he represented a Canadian physician in a leading case of pharmaceutical regulation in the European Court of Justice. 
as he came to the States and transitioned to thinking about bioethics, he's begun work, he's continued work at the intersection of human rights law, bioethics, and public health policy. Professor Marx has written for numerous journals of various kinds, including law, medicine, bioethics, and public health. And he's written for broader audiences, which I think is really important. I'm um, very <coughs> pleased that he could join us here today. Um, and he's uh, here specifically to talk about a book he's written that in Perils of Partnership with Oxford University Press that came out last year, where he talks about public-private partnerships in around public health. And I think this conversation we'll have with Professor Marx this, after, this morning will be a, a point of uh, jumping off for a broader conversation about public-private partnerships at the university. So it's my pleasure, and I hope you'll join me in welcoming Professor Marx. I'm gonna try a lavalier mic. If we need, just give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down if we need a change. Well, thank you, Professor Weaver, for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm a barrister by training, so hopefully you can all hear me. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about the perils of partnership uh, with a particular focus on public health. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit about how I got here. So, when I was born, a sales rep from a drug company gave my father, who was a family physician, 12 months supply of infant formula. Why? Because the drug rep thought that if the doctor's baby was being fed that brand of formula, my father, the doctor, would recommend it to all his patients. And so mother's milk, was SMA, simulated milk adapted. And as I like to tease my mother, that's where all my psychological problems began. <laughs> now, I, as a child, I also benefited from drug company largesse. All these pans, pads, slide rules, and the like, all containing the names of drugs. Um, I didn't understand them, I didn't know what they meant, but I knew they had something to do with my father's medical practice on the other side of town. In time, of course, I learned to pay for my own pens and notepads. I went off to Oxford where I studied to become a lawyer, and my life went on a particular trajectory which changed quite dramatically when I finally ended up in a conversation in a parking lot in the European Court of Justice about this woman here, Dr. Nancy Oliveri, who subsequently became my client. And I won't tell you all about her case, other than to say that she was a medical researcher who was required by the Canadian government to get industry funding for her research before they would give her any support. And so she did that. And then when, during the course of the trial, she began to be concerned that the drug she was investigating was more toxic over time and less effective over time than she had thought, and she wanted to reconsent all the patients. Um, the drug company essentially pressured her to do otherwise, and that created a legal dispute. Um, and I won't say very much more about the law other than to say it triggered what has become a lifelong interest in some of the et systemic ethical questions. What is the impact of industry sponsorship and partnerships in particular on research and policy making, especially in the public health sphere. And that's the line of inquiry which led to the book that I'm going to talk to you about today, The Perils of Partnership, Industry Influence, Institutional Integrity, and Public Health. And before I begin, I just want to flag something, make something explicitly clear. Um, I am not arguing that governments and the academic institutions are inherently good, and that corporations are inherently evil. On the contrary, each is capable of good or ill, but there are profoundly important reasons why we need some separation between the two. Now in the book, I spend a lot of time talking about partnerships with the food industry, and indeed here's an excerpt from a British newspaper about voluntary pledges created by big food and soda companies that other 
uh, corporations then signed on to. This was instead of regulating. My colleague Cecile Nye at the, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in her research has shown that when you give companies voluntary pledges like this, what they essentially do is they sign on to do things they would have agreed to do anyway or that reflect market trends. So for example, a chocolate company knowing that people want to eat less chocolate is quite happy to charge more for smaller individually wrapped portions of chocolate. In addition, what we've seen are soda companies, including one based in the city of Atlanta from which I just came, funding exercise initiatives throughout a number of city parks. Um, the purpose again being to detract attention from the role of their products in obesity and to position themselves as the solution to a public health problem rather than as what they are in fact doing, which is contributing to the problem. So I spent a lot of time on those examples in the book. I could have talked about others, including partnerships with the alcohol industry, partnerships with the vaping industry is yet another, and uh, you may have read a headline in the newspapers in addition to this one about a historic uh, black university and college in the US taking a large sum of money from Juul in order to explore the adverse health effects of vaping. Now obviously we do need to know about the adverse health effects of vaping, especially some of the acute lung injuries that have caught uh, media headlines recently. But ideally, that money shouldn't come directly from a commercial entity that has a vested interest in the outcome of that research. Now when I critique partnerships, people often say to me, okay, okay, I get that. I get why we shouldn't partner with those industries because they're all making products that are harmful to people. But what about a corporation that's working on solving a health problem? Surely we can partner with one of those. And my answer to that is, that's how we got the opioid crisis. So pain management is a totally neglected area in medicine. It only became a specialty in the 1970s. And there are very little tools we have to manage acute and chronic pain. But what we now know is that there have been an in excess of 400,000 deaths um, from overdoses in the US in the last two decades. So that's even more than in the figure there in the slide from the uh, CDC. And what we also know is that there was an upward tick in the 2010s, quite a dramatic upward tick. And that is, in my view, no coincidence. There is a reason why there was that upward tick. And it is in no small part due to webs of influence woven by opioid companies. Now, you've probably heard a lot about Purdue Pharma, the company owned by the Sackler family, and I may mention those uh, once or twice in this talk. But it's important to recognize that there are a handful of companies, not just Purdue Pharma. For example, um, Janssen Pharmaceuticals, which is a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson, was also another opioid company. It's important to know that the Johnson & Johnson family of companies also developed a high opiate yield poppy and supplied the active ingredients to other opioid manufacturers, including Purdue. So they benefited whether you were consuming their opioids or whether you were consuming Purdue or one of their other um, opioid companies' drugs that were made from their active ingredients. So what did opioid companies do? Well, um, they wove a web of influence, is how I describe it, with doctors and researchers, with universities and teaching hospitals, with patient advocacy groups, medical professional associations, medical journals, legislators and policymakers, and public health agencies, among others. What, were the purpose of these, what was the purpose of these webs of relationships built from partnerships and gifts and the like? Well, it was essentially to communicate four messages which were very important for the bottom line of the opioid companies. The first message was that our concerns about addiction were overblown. So they were trying to suggest that actually this generation of opioids was not as addictive as we might have feared. They also argued that their formulations of these drugs made them less prone to abuse. In addition, they argued that the scope of prescribing should be expanded beyond terminal cancer patients to others experiencing both chronic and acute pain. Now my father, uh, my late father had cancer. He was on OxyContin, 
um, we never had to worry about winning him off it because he was clearly going to die of cancer. Um, but for other patients with acute and chronic pain, opioids can be profoundly hazardous. And if you don't want to take my word for it, you should read the first person account of a fellow bioethicist, Travis Weeder, who wrote a book called In Pain, and talks about his experience of opioid addiction after a motorbike accident. So in addition to expanding the scope, and I should add, by the way, there's very little uh, evidence of the efficacy of opioids for chronic pain. Um, although that doesn't mean I think it never has any role. I have a friend who's a helicopter pilot. His helicopter uh, dropped out the sky. He survives, he says, only by virtue of his low-dose fentanyl patch. But uh, what I want to point out is the evidence is definitely not nearly as strong as the companies would suggest. And in addition, what the companies wanted, I'm sorry, was to increase the dosage of opioids. Why? Because the larger the dose, the more money. It's more lucrative when your patients are on higher doses of opioids. So let me talk about some of the relationships in turn. According to documents filed by the Attorney General of Massachusetts against Purdue Pharma, physicians who met with Purdue drug reps were 10 times more likely to prescribe opioids to patients who subsequently died of an overdose than physicians who prescribed opioids without meeting the drug rep. And indeed, that claim has been supported to some extent by some recent empirical work by Steve Hanland and others showing that more interactions with drug reps means more opioid prescribing, more opioid prescribing also associated with increased overdose deaths. And I want you to be very skeptical and cautious of messages which we will read in the press right now that will say the problem isn't prescription opioids anymore. Prescription opioids was just the first wave. Then came heroin, then came um, fentanyl, and now it's meth cut with fentanyl. And the reason why I want you to be very wary of those claims is because pharmaceutical companies are working on the next generation of prescription opioids, and they are essentially engaged in the same strategies they used to promote the last round of opioids, which gave us this epidemic. In addition to building relationships with doctors, they also built relationships with patient advocacy organizations and medical professional associations devoted to pain management. This report from the US Senate in 2017 records how a handful of pharmaceutical companies gave $9 million over a five-year period to 14 of these groups. What did the groups give them in return? Well, when the CDC um, was proposing guidelines to tighten up on opioid prescribing, these organizations, many of them, resisted the opioid guidelines. And some of them even prepared and drafted their own more lax guidance. Beyond doctors, patient advocacy groups, and professional associations, they also gave money to universities and teaching hospitals. This sweatshirt here is from the Sacra School of Graduate Sciences at Tufts. There was a, there was a pain clinic at um, Mass General. Um, indeed, other uh, uh, similar entities at Tufts School of Medicine named after Purdue, the family blurred the distinction between individual and corporate philanthropy. Most of my critique is about corporate, but I'm happy to say more in Q&A about the relation between the two. And then the building on the right is actually a building at the University of Buffalo named after John Kapoor and his late wife. And Kapoor was recently convicted of fraud and sentenced to roughly five years in prison for the aggressive marketing of his company's opioid. The company is Insys. The opioid is called Subsys. And then, above and beyond that, of course, what you would expect, uh, companies engaged in lobbying over opioid policies and the like. But I do want to emphasize that the reach of these strategies of influence goes well beyond the United States. Purdue Pharma is part of a family of companies globally, for example, called Munda Pharma. And as um, regulators' attention is focused more tightly in North America. They have been working hard to exploit international markets, as you would expect corporations to do. And indeed, my argument is we create corporations to make a profit by selling goods and services, and we should expect them to do so to the full extent that the law permits. What I'm asking is what are the responsibilities of government agencies, academic universities, and public health NGOs? So let's say something about the international reach. This is a, one of two policy documents produced by the World Health Organization in 2011 and 12. 
This one is on uh, the treatment of persisting pain in children. What does this document say? Well, it says there is no maximum dose of opioids even for children. And it, characterize, it characterizes physicians' concern about opioid use, concerns about addiction, as being opiophobia, a term the World Health Organization did not make up, but was derived from a Purdue Pharma document several years before that obviously worked its way into this WHO policy document. This document has now been withdrawn in light of the media attention that it has received, but it was basically in effect for most of the last decade, from 2011 and 12 to 2019. So, what is the dominant approach in public health right now? Well, the response to the opioid crisis demonstrates what the dominant approach is. When the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, in 2017 first finally recognized that it had a problem, and not a moment too soon, Barry Mayer had written a book way back in 2003 telling us the crisis was emerging. But anyway, in 2017, the NIH says, how are we going to respond? Public-private partnerships. A message, I should add, that the pharmaceutical companies, including Purdue, rather liked. How could we not help fight the prescription of illicit opioid abuse crisis? We want everyone engaged to know you have a partner in Purdue Pharma. That was an ad that ran in 2017-18 in three of the major broadsheets, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post. Um, what's interesting is that there were two versions of this ad a week apart. The first one acknowledged that opioids were addictive even when used as prescribed. In the second one, they took out that statement because they realized they were a bit worried about litigation. So the dominant strategy is we partner, and then what do we do? We just disclose that we have a relationship, as this cartoon from the New York Time, uh, from the New Yorker magazine rather, shows the physician giving his patient a prescription saying, try this, I just bought 100 shares. And I'm more than happy to say in Q&A why disclosure is simply not enough. My colleague Sunita Saar Cornell has been very eloquent in her work and in her research demonstrating this. I would add that it would have been important for the CDC to know that the patient advocacy groups resisting its guidelines tightening up on opioid prescribing were taking money from the opioid companies. But disclosure alone will not solve the problem of corporate influence of either um, opioid companies or indeed any other series of corporate actors in public health. So I'm going to argue here, and I argue in the book, for a different approach. Let me lay the groundwork for this approach. We are told that collaboration is good. We're told that compromise is good. And we're told the consensus, likewise, is good. Conflict, on the other hand, bad. Well, in my view, that's far too simple a vision of the world. You can't possibly know whether conflict is good or bad unless you know who is fighting, how they're fighting, and why they're fighting. And compromise. Well, if Jonathan and I compromise, we reach an agreement to our mutual benefit and it hurts everyone else in the room, that's deeply problematic, especially when one of us has an obligation to protect everyone else in the room. So tension, struggle, and conflict can be very, very important. And indeed, we know this. We're taught this in school. In fact, every eighth grader, including my daughter, was, is taught that there are three branches of government. The legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judicial branch, right? And as one famous constitutional scholar put it, the Constitution is, quote, an invitation to struggle addressed to those branches of government. Think about the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, plagued by 10 years of litigation. Now think about the next raft of health care reform. You can call it Trump Care, Sanders Care, the name of any president you love or hate, whichever you like. <laughs> we could save 10 years of litigation by having the White House sit down with congressional leaders and members of the Supreme Court in order to figure out which provisions would withstand constitutional muster. 
and just draft those ones. Why do we not do that? Well, the answer is quite simple. The function of the judicial branch is to determine the constitutionality of laws and hold the other branches of government accountable. It can't do that if it's involved in making the laws or if it climbs into bed with the other branches of government. So we get the importance of struggle, tension, conflict in the public sphere between the branches of government. We also get it in the private sphere. Imagine three companies, red, blue, and green, the manufacture over-the-counter pain medication. If those three companies got together and said, hey, let's agree not to drop the price of our pain medication below $10 a bottle, or imagine red said, we'll take the West Coast, green will take the East Coast, and blue will take everyone in between. That would be bad too, because we would pay more for the medicines we need. These kinds of agreements are what the Supreme Court has called the supreme evil of antitrust. Now, I don't like the language of good and evil, but what they're recognizing is why this kind of collaboration or collusion, as it's called, in antitrust is problematic. The proper relation of corporations is to compete with each other. And we, the public, benefit when they compete. So we totally get the need for struggle, tension, and conflict in the public sphere between branches of government. We totally get it in the private sphere between corporations. Why is it that we think we can solve cancer, climate change, obesity, the opioid epidemic, by having public and private collaborate with each other? I argue, no, that's a mistake. We need distance there too. Struggle, tension, and sometimes direct conflict. So, does this mean we have to just say no to industry money? Now that message was arguably offensive enough in the 1980s when delivered by Nancy Reagan, but it's especially offensive now if, like my colleague, Travis Reeder, you become addicted to opioids because you're prescribed them by a physician. But what I'm arguing is that we need to shift the default. The default right now is partnership is good. I argue we need to shift the default the other way. And in order to have a partnership, you're gonna to have to make an incredibly compelling case given the systemic problems we know these relationships develop, that create. So how would one make an extremely compelling case? Well, um, let me say that one of the first things you're gonna have to do is to think about the integrity of your institution. What is integrity? I think Jonathan has integrity because what he does is consistent with what he says, what he believes, and what he commits to promising to do, or promises to do. One can say the same thing about an institution. There should be an alignment between what the institution does, its practices, what it says it does, its mission, and what it's obligated to do, its purpose. And similarly, if you end up in a close relationship with another entity whose practices, mission, and purpose are at odds with your own, that's going to be a problem. And don't allow yourself to be fooled by a superficial alignment. At the one hand, it looks like, sure, yes, a corporation also has an interest in solving pain management. But the real interest of the corporation is in the largest doses to the largest population. For a public health agency, the right answer to this question is appropriate doses for the appropriate population. But this is not enough. It's not enough just to think about the implications for the integrity of your institution. You can't look at one relationship, one partnership in isolation. Why not? Well, because corporations don't do that. They look at these as a web of relationships. That's exactly their perspective. They would not be foolish enough to consider one of these relationships in isolation. They develop strategies that involve these webs of relationships in order to create influence. And so, Individual institutions, like this university, like public health agencies, like my own university, have to realize what, that their position is part of a web, the full extent of which they may well not know. So, where do we go from here? Well, first, as I say, sort of one mile mark is the, sh the short term, we have to shift the default to against partnerships rather than in favor. And then secondly, we need a larger long-term strategy to take 
corporate influence, corporate dependence out of medicine and public health, among many other spheres. Now, it's important to remember, as Bud Relman, the former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, warned in 1980, that it wasn't always this way. Public health was not always flush with corporate money. He warned about what he called the medical industrial complex, riffing on uh, President Eisenhower's caution about the military industrial complex. Um, Arnold Roman warned about that way back in the early 1980s. It was not always the case. Things were not always this way, and they need not always be this way. Now, people often say to me, we can't afford to do public health without corporate partnerships, corporate funding, corporate support. Here's my answer to that question, to that conundrum. According to the White House Council of Economic Advisors, over the last few years, the opioid crisis, leaving aside the wasted lives, the devastated communities, has cost the United States two and a half trillion dollars and counting. We cannot afford to carry on doing business as usual in public health. Thank you. And I'm happy to take questions. Yes, part of what we want to do, again, is to start a conversation. So please feel free to ask Jonathan any questions you've got about uh -huh. partnerships, about the opioid crisis, about his book. wasn't enough for patients. Can you elaborate a little more on that? Yeah, great question. Why is disclosure not enough? And the question was directed at uh, patients in particular. Um, so I have a sort of suite of three articles on corporate influence, opioid crisis, and the like, which follow the book. And in one of them, which is forthcoming in the American Journal of Law and Medicine, I deal with this quite extensively. But I'll give you some, some of the concerns that I have with disclosure. One is sometimes when people disclose right, that they have a conflict of interest, they feel licensed to gild the lily. In other words, to exaggerate even further because they put you on notice, I've told you. Um, another concern, of course, is, so in other words, it may exa exaggerate the biased advice that patients are receiving rather than reduce the biased advice. The other problem is, of course, that patients may not know what to do with the disclosure Right? And even if they understand its implications, may not be in a position to do anything about it. So some patients may think, hey, the fact that a drug company is giving money to buy a physician means my physician must be a great physician. Otherwise, why would the drug company give them money and call them a key opinion leader? Right? So in actual fact, it may have the opposite effect and burnish the reputation of the physician as well as the drug company in the eyes of the patient. Um, so that's a, another problem. Even if the patient were to be told everything about the social science data on the way in which um, corporate funding creates bias. And there's a body of data that shows everything from industry favored study, industry funded studies produce way more favorable outcomes to the industry sponsor than independent studies. There's data to show the physicians who have very small uh, financial interactions with drug reps prescribe the drugs more often even though they forget the interactions. Even if all that social science data was presented to a patient would they know where to go next? For a start, if you were in the room with your physician, it's too late. And indeed, I have another uh, set of colleagues, um, Susanna Rose, Christopher Robertson, and Sunita Sauer, who also did an experiment at the Cleveland Clinic. They sent patients an appointment letter, and with the appointment letter, they listed the conflicts of interest that the physician had, the drug companies from whom the physician was taking money. Well, um, 53%, I think, of patients remembered receiving and reading the letter, which suggests that 47% either it never registered or they never opened it. But then what do those 53% do? Well, not very much. It's too late. Right? How hard is it to get an appointment in the Cleveland Clinic? If you really want to know whether it was effective, then perhaps what you'd have to do is, the moment the patient is trying to make an appointment, they should be warned, look, you should know that your, this physician has financial relationships with these companies. They're relevant to your care in the following ways. Would you like an appointment with a physician who's just as good but doesn't have those relationships? Right? If you put it to people that way, they might have a different view. So yeah, that's why the simple disclosure and the models for disclosure that we have in the physician-patient encounter are inadequate. And I'll add one more piece to that. 
You can find out whether your physician takes money from industry. Did you know that? Yeah. Um, openpayments.gov. Um, and you can look on the database. According to Jenny Pham Cantor and other of my colleagues, I think only 13% of people in her study actually knew that this information was available. And it's disclosed, by the way, not by the physicians, but the drug companies. Um, a part of the Affordable Care Act required the drug companies to disclose this. It's on the database. Only 13% of people um, appear to know about it, and only 3% or so actually go and look to see whether the physician is taking money. Here is the broad effect, though. What you can see is that database has now been public for four years. And the basic bottom line is the same. On average, every year, there are 11 million or so payments um, totaling something in the region of $9 billion. And that level has stayed fairly stable. So one hypothesis was that disclosure would lead to less of these relationships. Right? This database actually shows that, again, that's why disclosure is not enough in its own, because it certainly has had no impact on the number of these relationships thus far. And just to be clear, I'm not arguing we shouldn't have disclosure. Disclosure is the ethical floor. It's the very minimum. But it is not all you need to do in order to address the problem, and you cannot solve corporate influence with disclosure alone. Thank you for that great question. Yes? Are there ways that other nations are interrupting that, whether there's a list, for example, like uh, ads for drugs, like patients ask for drugs because they see an ad for it or something like that, and that's not, from what I understand, as common in other places, and something that has changed over time here in the US. So is that one way? Disrupt that? Great question. So direct consumer advertising of uh, uh, prescription drugs, that was one of the first sort of bioethics papers I ever wrote because I came to the US and I started to read, you know, I can't, so basically there are two countries that do that, two developed nations that do this, the United States and New Zealand. There's no other developed nation that allows direct consumer advertising of prescription drugs. Um, and again, it's an, it, this is something that's evolved in the US over the last couple of decades. It was not always that way here either. Um, that is clearly problematic, and um, I should add, by the way, that the Supreme Court jurisprudence, which is what I wrote about in that article, is deeply disturbing and very strange to somebody with my human rights background outside the US. In the US, free speech, including commercial speech, trumps so many other things. In most other civil rights and human rights frameworks, it doesn't have that effect. And in a case called Thompson versus Western States, the Supreme Court said that even where public health is at stake, you interfere with commercial speech as a last resort, which to our eyes looks bizarre. So, but I want to emphasize to you that while I do think direct consumer advertising prescription drugs is problematic, and I have noticed that I'm thinking about a piece where I'm gonna address the way in which we see even drug names changing to reflect this. There was a time when physicians gave, I mean, obviously they're the generic names, but there was a time when physicians gave drugs brand names to make the physician sound smart to the patient, now the drugs are named so that the patient can remember the name and ask the physician well, for the fun drug. almost, in some ways. They rhyme, where they're supposed to oh, it's, it's kind of funny sounding. Some of them are even one syllable, like the yes. contraceptive, yes, right? So you can ask for yes, a drug which turned out to be problematic. Um, yeah, so the way in which they're named is also... Uh, Marketing. Yes, <laughs> exactly. And indeed, I, I once had a conversation with um, uh, somebody who said that his patient had worked for an advertising agency that was in, and she was in the room at the time somebody conjured the notion of restless leg syndrome, right? So, you know, these, uh, th there's a lot that goes on behind those closed doors, and in fact, the direct consumer advertising is just one piece of a large strategy which begins from the ghost management of publications, not the ghost writing, but the ghost management of a series of publications in order to get FDA approval. It's all part of one large strategy. And my friend Sergi Sismondo has written a book called Ghost Manage Medicine, which sort of articulates that. But I also want to emphasize to answer your question that I started with a number of examples in my slides from Britain. And I did that in order to show you that it's not just a problem in a country like ours that permits direct consumer advertising of pharmaceuticals. It's not just a problem in a country mm -hmm. like ours which allows for PACs and super PACs to influence um, elections. Even in a country like Britain, where um, there's a national health service, where uh, there's no direct consumer advertising of drugs, you know, even there, 
Oh, and by the way, where we have very tight controls on campaign finance, even there, partnerships are problematic. Yeah, exactly. May, may I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, um, I, it wasn't so clear about the exact. Yeah, so I. I, I the, the, my other question is I, I feel a little bit difficult to understand it because uh, if you're blaming the individual doctors who, who you know, not following ethics, and the, it's hard for me to imagine the doctors have so much uh, the connections with the opium uh, drug companies at uh, this level. I mean, yeah, they do get the free goodies. I can understand it here, there. Uh, you know, some occasional stuff here, there. But at uh, this level, Um, my work actually doesn't focus on individuals. I'm more focused on institutions, but it's it hard to, it's important to tell the, the position of the doctors. It's important to tell that part of the picture about doctors in relation to this story. I would be remiss if I didn't point out to you the overwhelming evidence about the correlation between doctors seeing drug reps and then having patients um, experience overdoses. I can't possibly omit that piece from the picture. But my book focuses on the responsibility of corporation, of um, institutions, public health agencies, academic research institutions like this one and my own. That's what I focus on in the book. But I think it's also important to note that we are all individuals, and all these institutions are made up of individuals, and we're all working in non-perfect environments. But we have a responsibility not just to do the best we can in the environments in which we're working, but also to try and change those environments in order to promote the kind of ethical behaviors that we'd like to see in ourselves and others. And I would add, as far as the FDA is concerned, is that um, a bit too late, a bit too little, a bit too late, but the FDA you know, now recognizes that there's a problem, but it should have done so a lot um, further back. But we've also created a system that's deeply problematic, because how do we know whether drugs are effective or toxic? We know because we've constructed a system which depends on the pharmaceutical companies for doing that research. And we know that whether you're talking about pharmaceutical research or phone safety research or food research, we know from meta-analysis after meta-analysis after meta-analysis that industry-funded studies produce more favorable findings to the industry sponsor than independent studies. Don't we want to know whether our drugs are effective and whether they're dangerous? Yes. We have a system that doesn't do the best job of telling us that. Now, I do think we have responsibilities as individuals, especially people in positions of power. Think of the American Medical Association. The American Medical Association spends more money on lobbying than any other institution in the US after the Chamber of Commerce. It is about time an organization like the AMA start to think about what it can do to protect and promote public health. A lot of the efforts are directed at making sure there's the right level of Medicare reimbursement rates and all the rest of it for its members, but is it a trade association or is it the responsibility of the American Medical Association to speak to fundamental problems which imperil the health of Americans? I would argue it's the latter. Yes. So you made a very compelling case partnerships can go wrong. Um, but what do you suggest as an alternative? Let's say a drug company is interested in identifying what coding might make its drug more resistant to abuse, uh, crushing and all these other things, say, in, in this domain. Or an air carrier is interested in determining what amount of training is good for pilots so that the flights are safer. How should they go about this? Are they out of the business at this point? Are you saying they cannot participate? So um, a number of people have proposed a variety of alternatives. Um, and let me give you two or three examples of alternative solutions. One sort of pioneered by my colleague Shel Shelley Krimsky at Tufts and has been picked up by Chris Robertson and others is what they call, um, some of what Christopher Robertson calls money blinds, but another way of thinking about it is to, to describe an example for you. So let's imagine we have a system where 
you know, a drug companies identified through lab studies and animal studies that this drug has real potential. You want to get a new drug approval from the FDA, instead of you doing the research, you give the FDA a bunch of money, and the FDA assigns a research team that is appropriate to conduct that research. So you assert an intermediary, which might be a government agency, between the industry funder on the one hand and the research team on the other. Now I think that's better than what we have now. It's not totally foolproof for a couple of reasons. One, any drug by the time you get to clinical trials has already been patented, so the research team knows whose drug it is they're testing, number one. Secondly, if in the case of, as in the case of my former client, Nancy Laveri, who's an expert in thalassemia, there are only a very small number of teams in the world that could do that research. And so if you're a pharmaceutical company working on a drug and you think, well, there's a team in Tel Aviv, there's a team in Florida, and there's a team in Pennsylvania, I don't know which one is doing those, but you know what? We'll just do what we do in relation to congressional elections, right? His position is more favorable to our industry, but she's more likely to get elected. So we'll give him 500,000 in a super PAC and her 460,000 in a super PAC. And that way, whoever gets elected will be sure to have my back covered. So the system of the intermediary that I've just described would have to come with a commitment to and a prohibition on receiving any external funding outside the system from any of the actors who are having their products tested. That's one alternative. Another alternative in the drug sector is to create, um, and this has been pioneered by Joe Stiglitz and others, this idea of a prize fund. Right now, there are incredible structural incentives for people to do medical research on problems that affect those of us who can afford to pay for drugs. What about the people in sub-Saharan Africa who can't afford to pay for drugs? One solution is companies forego their patent rights, but they make the drug, they develop the drug, and they're entitled to draw on the prize fund in accordance with the public health impact of their product as measured or assessed by third-party institutions. So that's two solutions. Here's a third interim solution, but not a perfect solution, but it's an interim one now. Right now, um, most universities, including this one and our own, charge a huge overhead um, to government funding agencies for research, the NIH, the NSF, and the like. When corporations come to the door, we welcome them in and we charge them a pittance in terms of overhead by comparison. What you could do tomorrow, the big 10 schools could get together, all the Ivy Leagues could get together. Alternatively, every school that's a member of the American Association of Universities could get together and so they, those days are over. Let's agree now, we're gonna charge industry the same overhead as we charge government agencies. And what are we gonna do with that additional money? We're gonna put it in a fund to fund research in the public interest, including research that is inimical or threatening to the commercial interests of those corporations. That's at least three solutions. May I ask, may I put the comment on that? But yes. I remember this would never happen. If you're saying corporate will give you the indirect cost to the university, and say you set it aside for the person, <coughs> that's not what the university is doing. I have no that, Sorry, that's what? That's you said the corporate will give also the same amount of indirect yeah. cost. Yeah. Well, there's no good reason why they couldn't think of them that way. That's money they don't have now. This would be new money. I why not? Tell you that's not gonna happen. Do you know what really, can I tell you what really push, pushes my button? This is what pushes my button. I listen to scientists all the time tell me, we're gonna solve cancer. We're gonna solve all the problems of the world. When I ask them, couldn't we solve the problem of corporate influence in medicine and public health? All that courage, all that energy, all that enthusiasm dissipates. I want to see the same level of courage and enthusiasm. I don't want people to tell me this is the way it's always been, this is the way it's always going to be. Because if we're serious about solving these public health problems, we have to also be serious about looking for solutions in places that are not consonant with the interests of industry. Otherwise, we're only looking at a half or a quarter or an eighth of the solutions. We can't solve them otherwise. 
not. And here's what I would also say to that. I think it's very hard for one university to do this on its own. But our provosts, our presidents, they're in a position of power. Seven or eight years ago, 130-something university presidents, including my president then at Penn State and probably yours too, wrote an open letter to the US Department of Commerce saying, please don't regulate our relationships with industry. We need that money to do our research and solve the problems we're trying to solve. That was a mistake. They should have written a letter to the federal government saying, you, the government, society, are relying on us, the academy, to solve these major public health, environmental, and other problems. If we're serious about solving these problems, we have to look at all potential solutions, not just those that will garner the support of industry. Yes? Yeah, well, I had, uh, and they're not related, but something on the disclosure. I just saw a, a speaking on Friday night about autonomy and in the situation that we've created that uh, the patients are actually They've got too much autonomy at some point in this in this facet that they're asking for the drug and almost forcing and shopping for the physician that will uh, give them that. And my other comment was, is there evidence that I, I see the exact same uh, birth of THC and CBD in kind of your your presentation here as far as uh, the growth and the proliferation. Um, so let me deal with your, uh, your first point about p patients. And uh, what I will say is that the evidence right now, I mean, I ha it's been a while since I looked, but the evidence suggests that when physicians are asked by their patients for a drug, they tend to prescribe it just over their own reservations because they want the patient to be happy. After all, our um, providing companies send us emails asking us to rate how happy we are with our physicians. And how happy we are usually depends on whether they get what it is that we want. Um, as for uh, THC and CBD, this is not an area that I have thought about a huge amount, but I will tell you, I'll give you another example and, and there are relations between the two. Wherever you have <laughs> a powerful economic incentive to do X is where you need regulation, right, to protect us. Doesn't matter whether it's pharmaceuticals, it doesn't matter whether it's supplements, which by the way are terribly regulated, doesn't matter whether it's nutraceuticals, which are even more poorly regulated, and it doesn't matter whether it's THC or CBD. One concern about THC and CBD, of course, is, just to give you an example, the levels of purification would also concentrate pesticides. And so that is a legitimate concern, but right now we don't have a sufficient regulatory framework in order to test that. In fact, I think Consumer Reports is trying to crowdfund money in order to look at that. But really, we shouldn't have to depend on consumer reports to crowdfund the resources to do that. We should have a regulatory system that ensures that whatever we're taking, whether it's THC, CBD, nutraceuticals, pharmaceuticals, or whatever, is not going to harm us. Okay, Sarah, you have a question? Yes. I'm curious, has there ever been any research on anything like unconscious biases on the part of doctors because you seem to be operating or maybe your field operates with the presumptions of guilt and maybe these doctors are unaware that they're being influenced by the pharmaceutical industry. <coughs> they, they, they take advantage of advertising heuristics. The reason they give those pens is they know there's something called the availability and familiarity heuristics where it's the first drug that comes to mind when something uh, needs to be prescribed. So they may not even be aware of these biases and this is important because most doctors are good people and don't intend to do harm. And maybe they aren't cooperating with you because you walk in with a presumption of guilt instead of innocence. Um, well, the, uh, it's not a question of cooperating with me because I actually don't focus on physicians. I, I mean you writ large. large. Yeah, so the, um, is there any me writ large? Anyway, <laughs> um, so what, what I would say is, yes, there's a huge body of social science on that. And I do think, I will just speak about my own father I'm utterly confident that my father would not have taken those gifts if, when he was receiving them, there had been the body of social science there is now about the influence they wield, had he known about it. What is intriguing, though, is some of the empirical studies where people ask physicians about relationships with drug companies. And again, I, I agree, it's not a case of malevolence, but it's, and it's somewhat entertaining and perplexing when 
physicians say, I am not influenced by this relationship. But then when they're asked if they think their colleagues are influenced, they say yes. So it can't be the case that no physician is influenced, but all their colleagues are influenced, right? Something's <laughs> wrong there. In answer to your question, I do think it should be a central part of physician training that they get that evidence, the social science data on the influence of private sector bodies, yes. And I think I know some fearless, fearless medical students who are actually very nice physicians. But I'll give you an example. When I was at the Safra Center at Harvard, um, one of my fellow fellows was then a medical student by the name of Kirsten Eistad. What she did was um, she stood up to her educational institution, Harvard Medical School, and said, this is ridiculous. We're getting our education from doctors who have conflicts of interest and we have no idea. And as a result of her and her colleagues pushing for it, um, they changed the medical school policy at Harvard. Now, every physician at Harvard, when they give a lecture to the medical students, has to put up, as their second slide says, one of the following. I have no financial conflicts of interest. I have financial conflicts of interest and they are not relevant to the content of this lecture. I have financial conflicts of interest, they are relevant to the content of this lecture and here's what they are. Now again, I just want to emphasize in an ideal world, these relationships would not exist. Disclosure is not going to solve the problem when you're creating practice guidelines and every member of the practice guideline committee has taken money from industry or 75% of them have taken money from industry. Disclosure is not going to solve the problem. When you start to look at the largest patient advocacy groups in the US and you realize that 80% of them take money from industry. That's um, getting to the, the state of what I'm calling in my article a kind of exhaustive influence where it becomes hard to find now a truly independent actor. So I know, I, I hope I answered your question and maybe went even beyond it. <laughs> there was another hand, yes. Just at the conference we were both at Atlanta, Jonathan, during one of your, uh, I'll talk about your book, uh, Leonard Orton with the CBC and one of his colleagues offered an interesting counterpoint. I wondered if you might talk with us a bit about. So Orman said, and his colleagues at the CBC said, we couldn't do the work we did without the partnerships we have. And that the, the approach you're taking, I think Orman called um, some form of deep pessimism, right? He, had yeah, a, he, he called it the hermeneutics of suspicion. The hermeneutics of suspicion. <laughs> Yeah, so his, his take was that there's a, there's a, you're offering something that's, and, I, and if I remember your response correctly, it's that this is really important because even if I'm being suspicious, it's something that we don't often hear about, and that's even more reason to talk about it. But Orman and his colleagues at the CDC said, look, there are some ways in which partnerships can be managed such that they do good. And some of that was a little naive. I remember Orman's colleague saying, uh, we just, the best opportunity would be to take money and say, you're not going to get anything out of it. We just want to solve this problem, give us some money to do it. Um, and then all of the implicit bias concerns that Dr. Fiore have sneak back in. But I wonder if you might talk us through that, because whether it's the CDC or whether it's academic institutions, partnerships still drive us. And even if they, in an ideal world, they shouldn't, even if they should be fully separated, in what ways can we deal with them ethically now? So that's a great question. And I will tell you that I gave a talk uh, at another institution um, a public health agency which spends, I don't know, <coughs> maybe a third of its budget via partnerships. And I thought that in response to my talk, I was going to receive the verbal equivalent of tomatoes. <laughs> and I will tell you that um, it was a therapy session. People went round the table one after the one and told me of their partnerships with a variety of industries and how they had all gone wrong. Now, I know there are happier and less happy stories of partnerships. But the reason why I resist what I'm often invited to do, which is show me a model partnership and we'll copy that, is because that's missing an important piece of the picture. These relationships don't exist in isolation. They are webs of relationships. The effect, whether or not um, the purpose is this, is this case, but clearly the effect is to distort agendas to frame public health problems in ways that are um, most friendly to the commercial interests of the corporate partners. I mean, so I think, you know, and actually in that session, I was pushing um, back a little, and one of the things that Leonard Orman said in that session was, and I thought you know, he made a positive point, that instead of just thinking what we can partner with industry on, we should think about 
what communities want us to do for them, what communities need, and that's where we should begin. And I asked him, I suggested to him that he ask another question. And the other question is, what public health problems do we have a responsibility to solve that would be threatening to or undermine the interests of this commercial entity? Because if we shy away from that, that's a problem. And I'll tell you that my concern about partnerships is that usually there are three categories of public health intervention. One is an intervention that you'll get industry funding and support for. Two is an intervention for which you won't get industry funding, but industry doesn't really care. It's not threatening, it's not beneficial to them, they'll leave you alone. The third is something which may be a major public health impact, but it's threatening to a commercial entity or a commercial sector. When you take money from industry, what happens? Number one gets done, right? It's a favorable thing. Number three drops off the agenda entirely because you don't want to piss off your corporate sponsor. And number two often gets forgotten about. So that's problematic. So I think we've got it the wrong way around. I think we first of all have to ask ourselves, what are the compelling public health needs? And especially, what are the very kinds of problems we're neglecting? Because corporations have no interest giving you money for 25 years to solve a problem that's chronic. Right? They want results yesterday. So what they're doing is they're taking you and they're directing all your efforts to problems where you can demonstrate an impact in six months, 12 months, a year. So that's what's deeply problematic. So, but I will add that I don't say absolutely never, 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 ever. I am open to somebody making a compelling case, but it has to be a really, really compelling case. And it has to be the exception, not what we have right now, which is the rule. And that, I think, is, is deeply problematic. Any other questions for Professor Marks? And I would just say one last thing. Please. And I think at the same time while we're doing that, we have to think about how we want to make the world of public health the kind of place that generates the research that we really need to solve our most pressing problems. Thank you. Thank you.